All right, different kind of boomer chair video today because I want to talk about ancient forgotten boomer technology that's now come full circle and is considered cutting edge in the world of drag racing. Compressed air superchargers. So in recent months, there have been several cars out there running a system manufactured by a company called, oddly enough, Compressed Air Superchargers out of California. And these cars are running strong. They're not hurting themselves. They're going rounds. They're turning numbers. They're winning races using compressed air as the supercharger. So in lieu of, instead of a supercharger, you know, a procharger or roots type of supercharger or a turbocharger or a nitrous oxide or anything else, these guys are just using compressed air stored in bottles, force fed into the engine and they're sending it and the stuff is working. Now, this is something that I had looked into pretty deeply in the middle 1990s when I was, I was deep in the nitro thing. And I looked at compressed air supercharging as something that may or may not work because several people had tried it in the past, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So I studied the examples and I talked to whoever was available at the time about these systems. It didn't, it was a dead end at the time. I didn't have the resources to build anything like that myself. And it was, it was pointless trying to find a backer for it because the rule structure, the NHRA and the IHRA rule structure at the time dictated 1471 blower. That's it. No options for anything else. So I looked into it. It was technically intriguing, but that was it. It was a dead end for my purposes at that time. So I want to look at two examples. Um, I'm going to show you two examples. And, and I have to credit my buddy Brian Loans for the pictures on this story because I texted him this morning and I says, I want to do a thing on compressed air supercharging. Can you get me pictures of this, that, and the other thing? And he, and like within seconds, he texted me back the pictures. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. One of the greatest historians in the sport. You want to know about anything that happened in the world of drag racing at any particular time, Brian is the guy. And his channel, just Brian Loans, great videos. Thank you, Brian. So, two examples. One that was hopelessly outdated before it ever actually hit the drag strip, and one that was so far ahead of its time, it was way too far ahead of its time. And it actually, it appears to me, it looks very similar in execution to what these guys are doing today with their compressed air superchargers. So, uh, the first example, uh, uh, Art Malone, Colonel Art Malone. So now, if, if you've never heard of this guy, um, and it's a shame if you haven't, because Art Malone was like a true renaissance man. Uh, he was involved in IndyCar racing, stock car racing, drag racing. He ran top fuel dragsters. He ran top gas dragsters. Uh, he ran a fuel funny car. And uh, he, he was, the guy had his hands in, any, in everything. He... Uh, DeSoto Memorial Speedway, the drag strip in Bradenton, was actually his. Um, he passed in 2013, the place was empty for a couple of years, and then Cletus moved in. So the Freedom Factory, you know, Cletus' whole operation was at one point Art Malone's. So back to the compressed air thing. So in 1967, Malone has this idea to replace the 671 blower with a compressed air tank. Now, here's, here, he got robbed. He got robbed just because technology kind of like sidestepped him while he was building this car. So the state of uh, the art in 1967, as far as top fuel goes, was really nothing like what we have today. Uh, the, the slipper clutch had just come into play and tire technology was evolving. But the typical top fuel run was very simple, very straightforward. They would push start the car, or sometimes start them on rollers, bring them around to the starting line, stage, and go. There was no burnout, backup, all of that stuff that we know today. Dragsters just ran a very, very straightforward thing. Fire it up, stage it, go. So along these lines, Malone figured that he would be able to have enough air in a tank to keep the engine running for that very short period of time where the, all he had to do was just fire it up, pull it to the starting line and send it. So he starts building this car in 1867. 
And this is a radical car. By, by in every the compressed air part of it was actually almost the least radical part of it. This was a 225 inch long. Now keep in mind a long dragster in 1967 was like a 180 inch wheelbase. This was over 220 inch long wheelbase dragster. And it was a rear engine and it was a sidewinder. And he needed all of that length and it for it to be a rear engine car because of the size of the tank that it took to feed this thing air from the time it fired to the time it actually went down the track. It was a brutally simple setup. Just compressed air plumbed directly to the top of the engine with an on-off valve. That's it, right? Stage the car, slam the valve, and go. Very, very simple. So it takes him two years to build this car. Now, the car itself is just absolutely amazing. As I said, it was a sidewinder. There were many sidewinders during this period of time, before the late 1950s into the 1960s. Many sidewinders, and a sidewinder is just where they take the engine and they mount it sideways. So instead of having the motor like this and then the rear axle like this, the motor is sideways in line with the rear axle, and they're driven by a chain, some of them are driven by gears. Well, what Malone did is, I guess to save in, in space and distance because of this Jaganda tank he needed to carry. He actually mounted the engine between the back wheels. Typically a sidewinder would have the motor mounted in front of the rear wheels. Well, this was mounted between the rear wheels. And in order to accommodate an axle, he actually sent the axle, a three inch tube, through the valley of the 426 Hemi. So above the, so if, let's say if you took the intake manifold off, you'd look into it and you would see an axle and then underneath the axle you'd see the cam and the lifters and all of that crazy stuff on the one end of it there was a clutch on the other end of it and then the clutch was was chain driven and on the other end of it was was the front of the engine the, the fuel pump and all of that um it had dual disc brakes but on one wheel so it was like one rotor with two uh two calibers crazy setup so like i says oh and pictures so there aren't any pictures of this car with the tank in place from the day the car wasn't photographed until middle of 1970 and by that point the compressed air thing was done you couldn't do anything with it and i'll tell you why in a second so the pictures most of the pictures that we have of this car or or without the tank by the time you you see the car in pictures it has a 671 blower and it, it's much more conventional and it ran like 70 then this is at a time when like 660s 650s were were running hard actually running really hard uh at 225 miles an hour so the car wasn't a slouch but you see the car you see the shape of the chassis in front of the cockpit where it's really really wide and it narrows in well that wide part was was where the tank would fit now the car still exists it's in the garlitz museum and in the garlitz museum it's actually got the tank that it was intended to be run with so that's the only picture i've got of the car complete with the tank and the air injection system on top of the engine now the reason it was outdated before it hit the track despite all of this like crazy next level technology and right, engineering was the fact that during that period of time between 1967 and 1969, 1970, while, while he was building this car, top fuels changed completely. The Crower Glide clutch came in, tire compounds changed, and now dragsters were doing burnouts like the funny cars. Well, that tank won't do the job anymore. The, you know, you, it's, the tank is enough to fire the car, stage it, and send it, but not enough to fire the car do a burnout, back up, stage, and go through the whole rigmarole. So by the time the car was ready to actually run, it was outdated. And you see the car uh, in the pictures from Hot Rod Magazine from the December, was it December? I don't remember the month. November, 1970. Uh, you see the pictures of the car and it's got a Crower Glide on it. Um, it, was, it was as state of the art as he could make it. Um, 
but like I said, that, that was it. That was the end of the experiment for that. Now, if the sport hadn't, if technology hadn't uh, changed, the evolution of drags of technology hadn't changed so drastically in that period of time, there's a good chance that car would have changed everything. But it is what it is. And like I said, the car is currently in the Garlitz Museum. It, it's a real masterpiece. Um, now, the other, the other one. And this was far more sophisticated than this was. This was built by Mickey Thompson uh, during the late 1970, early 1971. And Thompson had a completely different approach. Uh, this was for a funny car. And like I said, by that point, the, the routine that we know today, where you fire the car, do a burnout, back up, stage, and all of that stuff, had become the routine. So it was obvious you couldn't have the engine only being fed compressed air during that period of time. You'd need a tank the size of a drag strip to do that. So what he did was he incorporated four scuba tanks, each filled with 2,000 pounds, 2,000 PSI of air. These four scuba tanks were plumbed through a network of, of valves, it, it, just, just, just craziness, just craziness. Look at the schematic, there's a picture of the schematic here. And what they did here was they used a Bors 429 and they used a modified Enderly bug catcher. So, you know, the bug catcher has the three butterflies, okay? Well, they made a different face for this thing. And it has, instead of three separate butterflies, it has a flapper on either side. And then the center is the air intake from the four scuba bottles. So what happened was you'd start the car, do the burnout, back up and all of that, pulling air through the outside flappers. And then when you stage the car and you hit the air, the flappers would close and the engine would be fed from the four uh, scuba bottles. Very interesting setup. Now, Thompson made, this is crazy, okay? Thompson made 2,700 horsepower on straight alcohol with this thing. They strapped it to a dyno and sent it. Made 2,700 horsepower with it on alcohol. Now, at the time, a killer, killer, state-of-the-art blown nitro deal was only worth about 2,100, 2,200, 2,300 horsepower or thereabouts. So on straight alcohol, compressed air, this thing was making more power than the, the stoutest of the blown fuel motors at the time. He had two problems with this now. The first was that that power was uncontrollable, right? The, the, tuning, the, the tuning aspects of this were difficult to say the least. It was more or less all or nothing. You could bleed it in slowly, but slowly was a relative term. It would hit the motor and just blow the tires off. At the time, they were using very simple three disc crower glide, you know, three disc, six finger crower glide clutches. There was no control as far as ignition. There were no, there was no clutch management, no, nothing like that. All of the technology that came along later to stick that kind of power, it, it hadn't arrived, it wasn't gonna arrive until the 1980s. So the car was handicapped by its lack of technology. And then there was another problem with it too. And I said he was using the Boss 429 and this thing wouldn't hold head gaskets. So the Boss 429, for you guys that don't understand, don't know the engine, it didn't use conventional head gaskets. It used O-rings. It used four separate O-rings around each cylinder and then smaller O-rings to seal off the other passages, the water and the oil passages in the cylinder head. Well, this thing wouldn't hold head gaskets. It, it, blown nitro would marginally hold head gaskets. It's one of the reasons why the Boss 429 never really saw much success in the world of blown fuel racing. Um, it was it was abandoned before it really had a chance to go. The, the 429 didn't really find its its way in drag racing until the Mountain Motor Pro Stock days uh, came on in 1982, 1983, and then it found a home. But it wasn't happy on nitro, and it definitely wasn't happy with 2,700 horsepower worth of compressed air, you know, supercharging. So those are two examples of cars that were built and run over 50 years ago. Wow, yeah, way over 50 years ago. God, I'm old. <laughs> right. uh, 
and why they didn't work. What's the difference between the systems that they're using today and let's say the one that Mickey Thompson has used? Um, it's hard for me to say because I'm not that well versed in the system that they're, they're running with now. It's interesting and the, there's enough information out there if you're really curious about it, you can do a quick search, a YouTube search, and you'll find several videos explaining the system and, and the ins and outs and so on and so forth. It's not cheap. It's not a simple system and it's not cheap. You're talking about a, a, a roughly $15,000 for the basic setup, which is kind of comparable. You can put a couple of turbochargers or, or you know, a state-of-the-art pro charger setup on it. It's, it's kind of, and, or nitrous, it's kind of compatible. It's about that same range. But yeah, the, the price of admission is about 15 grand. And of course, like anything else in racing, it goes up from there. And then of course, there's a support system that has to go with it because you, you do need to fill the bottles. So, you know, there's that whole, that, that whole deal. But it has a lot of advantages in that, you know, turbocharging, you've, you've always got a heated mixture, you've got to use an intercooler, none of that, right? And also, there's, there's also exhaust restriction when using a turbocharger. With the compressed air, there's none of that. The, the air going into the engine is chilled as it's expanded, as it's let out of the tank. So intake temperatures drop rather than rise. There's no need for an intercool or anything like that. You don't have the parasitic losses of a supercharger of any sort. So it has pros, it has cons. The people who are using it are having success with it. They seem to be happy. So, you know, let's see where it goes from there. What I would like to know it's related, but it's a little bit different. What I would like to know is why nobody has attempted, at least to my knowledge, a compressed air turbocharger. So back in the 60s, it was a company called Turbonique, and one of their products was a rocket-powered supercharger, really a turbocharger. Um, it was self-contained. It had a little rocket. It was powered by thermoline. And what you would do is when you stage the car, you'd pull the pin on this rocket and it would instantly produce, God only knows how much, because the rocket would fire directly into the turbocharger, spool it instantly, and you were leaving with all the boost before you even opened the throttle. So uh, there was a, uh, one of the test cars that they used for this was a, was a bone stock 273 Barracuda that was running in the middle tens. And this, this is like a 1966, 1965. Uh, bone stock, through the single exhaust. And it was running in the tens with one of these rocket superchargers. And I've always wondered why nobody, or if somebody has ever used a compressed air setup similar to that to spool up a turbocharger. It would seem that it would, it, to me that it would take a lot less air volume to, to run, you know, to, let's say, to, to, to spool up a turbo than to actually feed the engine. But then again, you know, it's, I, I don't know. There are guys who do this for a living. I'm not second-guessing anybody. I'm just saying it's an interesting concept. I don't know of anybody who's actually tried it, but it, it's, it's something to think about. All right, so that's it. Yeah, what's old is new again. There is nothing new under the sun. Anything anybody could think of in, in terms of like drag racing or hot riding technology has already been tried. Most of it was tried back during the war by both the Germans and the Americans, and you know, and, and then and then the the bleed off or the, uh, the passing it down through the hot rodders, you know, from from the dry lake days and all that. There's nothing new under the sun. It's all been tried before. And this time around, it's compressed air supercharging. Very neat stuff. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll see you tomorrow.